Thank you. Right. Are you suggesting that someone's trying to make a real life sequel? Stab two? Who'd want to do that? Sequels suck. No. Two in the box! Ready to go! We be fast and they be slow! Wow! A second Super Saiyan? Second in order, perhaps, but by no means in stature. Your fight is with me now. I'll have my revenge and Death Stalker too. Man, I can't fucking believe this. Another basement, another elevator. How can the same shit happen to the same guy twice? Oh, please, please. By definition alone, they're inferior films. Okay. Awesome. All right, we'll start in three, two, one. Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in to Inside the Sequel, the podcast where we talk about underrated sequels that don't get enough love or attention, or we just bring them to your attention to check out. Um, I'm your host as always, Chris, and we're back after a six-month hiatus, and I am super excited to get this show finally going in 2022. We have a lot of great episodes planned in the month of June. This one's one of my favorite and most anticipated because we have a first-time guest here, and we're talking about... Uh, a very old film, and I think we haven't talked about a film this early um, since I think our very first episode, which was Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, today, we're talking about the 1936 sequel to The Thin Man. We are talking about After the Thin Man. And after the Thin Man, William Powell and Myrna Loy recreate the roles of Nick and Nora. Walk this way, sir. Well, I'll try. This time, the crime takes place among Nora's own blue-blooded relatives when her cousin is accused of murder. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. I didn't. A very young James Stewart stars in this surprise-filled blend of mirth and mystery. Having a good time, Mrs. Charles? It couldn't be better. After the Thin Man. And today, I am very excited for the guest. Uh, again, of course, we have um, almost a regular uh, in the last year. We have the host of Cobwebs. We have Daniel Epler. Daniel, how are you? Hi, I'm doing good. Oh, hang on one second. If we're talking about the Thin Man, I got to get my martini ready. I'm already three Tom Collins in, so I'm, you know we're back to our regular scheduled programming of recording here. Did Nick Charles drink a Tom Collins? He would at least. He yeah. Would. It's in black and white, and I can't tell what color the liquor is unless it's dark. <laughs> but I'm doing good, Chris. How are you? I'm great. I'm so glad to have you on, as always. And uh, we have a first-time guest. Uh, and, you know, since it's an older film, it's in black and white, it's a romantic comedy of sorts, I figured I'd ask the man himself. I invited Preston Sturgis. Uh, excuse me. I mean, pr uh, Preston Mitchell um, from <laughs> Mutual, Mutual I just, Friend. I just clicked of Daniel and I's on Twitter, who was also, uh, I guess, on an awesome episode of Schlock and All, and of course on Cobwebs. Uh, Preston Mitchell, how are you, man? Uh, I'm, I'm doing well, Chris. Um, thank you for that awesome introduction, um, and thank you for having me. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. You know, I say, I call you Preston, sir, just like I know his works. I've seen like only one film of his, so I'm really just a poser. Man, you've only sure. seen one of Preston's movies and he came, and he came to your podcast and everything? Well, like me, I'm sure he had a six-month hiatus from his filmmaking and, you know, he's getting his, his you know, he's getting his <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm honored. Yeah, no problem. Hey, lads, I'm happy to have you two on. I figured, you know, first episode, I'm going to have guests on. I want to have people that I'm super comfortable with and, like, if I make mistakes, they'll laugh at me, but, like, not hurt me to the point where I'll never record again, like Mitch, you know? So <laughs> that's fair. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it also it's because I know you two chads are like stands of classic cinema. And it's like, that's just like something I just don't get to cover. If it's, if you know, all of last year, it was like more modern horror movies or like nostalgic kids films. I really get to talk about like older um, films, which I do enjoy. And I know you two based on, you're one is a podcast and Preston, I know you on Twitter always talking about black and white films and you were on cobwebs as well. Um, it's like, I need people who like that stuff and who can also converse with me and educate me. And uh, I think you guys were the two to do it for me. Well, uh, no, thank you for saying that seriously. Um, yeah, no, um, as I, um, as I told Daniel, um, uh, 
you know, when we first like met virtually, like I, I love classic movies. Um, they were a big entry point into me getting into film, um, especially during my formative years. Like that was kind of, um, I, I had like the, the 90s, early 2000s family movies because I think I'm, I'm close uh, to y'all in age, I believe. And so uh, I grew up on a lot of that stuff, but whenever, I was such a curious kid that whenever I would um, tell, like, whenever I would walk in on my parents watching stuff, it was like stuff like uh, the Three Stooges. Um, <laughs> so yeah. like, I've all, always, I love like goofy, like screwball comedy, physical comedy like that. Um, and of course, through, through my mother, especially, um, cause I, I'm very close with, with, with her as a parent, um, was how I kind of got into film noir and, and eventually westerns and, and those sorts of things. And of course, when I was a teenager, you know, that's when I, I really got knee deep, as I think a lot of us do, into uh, the Finchers, the Chris Nolans, and, and, and guys like that, the, the, the quote unquote film bro directors, uh, <laughs> who I love. But nice. Well, wait. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop you before you start talking about Western films though, because if I know Dana is a huge fan of them, I don't need two people <laughs> putting a gun <laughs> on me and saying, watch more Westerns, you idiot. It won't be, it wouldn't be just a gun. It'll be a six shooter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I like how you say knees deep, like a clean, classy gentleman. You don't say gross balls deep like I do. So Preston viewer listeners, I'm sure they can tell disparage between the two. Who's more elegant. Um, and then Elegant. Daniel, <laughs> and then Daniel, obviously I know you love classic films. I've been on your podcast. How many times to talk about those things? Um, and it's kind of interesting because we're talking about a film that has Jimmy Stewart and you did your most recent episode, um, on Destry rides again with James Stewart. That's right. Yeah. We talked about Destry rides again and the naked spur, which Preston was on for. So we're Preston and I are back together talking about Jimmy Stewart, which is fun. Uh, but this is a rare Jimmy Stewart movie because he's not often a supporting actor. He's nowhere near being the lead of this movie. He's nowhere close to having his name over the title. And that's even early in his career. It's very, very unusual for him. Um, Cause normally I'm watching a Jimmy Stewart. I'm watching it because of Jimmy Stewart, but I'm watching this movie for William Powell and for Myrna Loy. So it's a weird little anomaly in his career. And it's cool. Like it's, it's really cool to see him just, be a good supporting actor just off to the side because he can do that really well too. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I agree. Um, and Preston, you know, per inside the sequel tradition, if you're a new guest, I have to put you on the spot and ask like, are you a big fan of sequel films? Like, do you stand a few sequels that maybe we haven't covered before or uh, we have mm -hmm. covered and you're like, you know what, Chris, I actually stand that film. So back the fuck off. Um, you should have invited <laughs> me on that episode. Beverly Hills Chihuahua too. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Complete the trilogy. Put this podcast out of its misery and do the third one with me, please. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, well, uh, no. Well, to answer, to answer your first question, uh, I, I, I would consider myself a big fan of sequels. Like, I love uh, all three of us were talking off mic um, about um, both Star Wars movies and uh, superhero movies. And uh, I would say if you're a fan of superhero movies, at the very least, you had to be a fan of sequels by default, because especially at this point. Um, <laughs> they're uh, all sequels. That's, they're that's all, sequels. all you get now. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> this is a sequel to like three other movies at once. And then it connect. Yeah, it's a it's whole thing. Um, but no, um, I really love, um, speaking of sequels, I'm a big fan of. I mean, uh, currently right now, I'm actually rewatching a lot of the old uh, James Bond movies. I say old, but like I'm, I'm doing... I haven't done a rewatch of all, all 25 as, a, as an adult. So I'm doing those right now. Um, so um, people who follow me on Twitter, they'll see me tag hashtag 60 years of bond. So I'm doing that at the moment. So I'm a big fan of those. Um, I really love your Blade 2 episode that had Dale on it. I, I believe um, our buddy Matt was on that episode as well. That was such a fun episode. Um, Did you know he dressed up as Blade for that recording too? <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh, <laughs> oh, <he did>. <laughs> <laughs> we can for canceling purposes we didn't post a video for this it. <laughs> we know dollar tree stocks are down as is because they're a dollar quarter now so we couldn't do that to the company head <laughs> oh goodness I, I love that no but no no but um i love your sounds of lambs episode as well um oh, like especially because most people don't see that as a sequel and, it, and 
and I think part of that is because uh, when we think of sequels, we think of them as very uniform with one another, uh, very close by in visual signature. And, and the Lecter series is, is one where you can feel each director's signature, even Brett Ratner mm -hmm. with Red Dragon. <laughs> but, yeah. but yeah, I mean, goodness. I mean, my favorite sequels, I guess, um, I mean, I feel like my list is boring. I mean, I love Aliens. I'm a big fan of that one. Uh, Terminator 2, so I am a Jim Cameron person. Oh, good. Um, Avatar 2, baby. Avatar 2. I'm so hyped. I'm so hyped. Yes. Um, yeah, no. Um, God, there's others I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm blanking on. Um, but those those are a few of my, of my favorite sequels for sure. No, that's cool, man. And I'm happy to hear that you like the very similar movies as us. I think we're going to get along very well. Uh, but yeah, I... I really liked, he talked about superhero movies. Daniel knows, I mean, he was on for Hellboy 2 and Blade 2. Um, I mean, how many times we oh, referenced yeah. so many two, early 2000s, like superhero movies. I totally get that. Speaking of superhero movies, you were in Schlock and All and you did on the the Suicide Squad, I think is what we call it now, the, the James yeah. Gunn film. I really enjoyed that one. That When I listened to that, I was kind of like, oh, I need to see what's going on with everyone's podcast and stuff. And I stumbled on that one because I had recently watched it finally um, when the episode aired. And uh, I was like, oh, there's some good things there. Like that you kind of maybe appreciate the movie just a little bit more. Um, so I thought you did awesome I, there. Uh, and yes, I just got to say like you did good there. And I was like, that's how I need to have him there. Um, with Daniel, I really just invited him for his knowledge and clout purposes. So um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> but here's the thing. So when we're talking about early like the thin man films you know we talk about like sequels like this movie franchise which i didn't know at the time i thought there was only one movie and it was a movie that daniel told me i should watch often and get into um i didn't realize there were six movies in this franchise and i remember constantly asking him like how many of these freaking things are there um but this movie the franchise started in 1934 um with uh you know, to put it into perspective, in 1934, other movies that came up besides the thing, man, uh, I think you guys know these. It happened one night, Black Cat. And then one other movie I thought that was interesting. I never heard of it, but it did have both of our leads on top of Rosalind Russell called Evelyn Prentice. Um, 1934, do you guys have anything to put towards those movies? I mean, that's pretty early for me. Like, I know people are like, oh, I've seen all these movies. They're great. But it's like, when it comes to... I guess the silver screen era, I am not as educated. Um, like, was it just common for having leads who just get along and just making a franchise out of them? Well, I oh. have two. Oh, go, go ahead, ahead, man. Um, so I have, I have a couple things to say to that. I think um, I think the, the first and foremost thing about the Thin Man franchise is that it predates television. And, uh, well, how, let me put it this way. My facts are on the first TV are not straight. I'm not a historian of all things uh, <laughs> media, but um, it predates the TV age. Because in the 50s, that's when I believe um, majority of households in America that were middle class had, had televisions. And so uh, prior to that age, the way that cinema, since it was, it was a new time, I mean, 1934, that's the birth of the romantic comedy as we know it with uh, It Happened One Night. Um, and of course, I think other movies that year include 20th Century, uh, I believe, The Gay Divorcee and other stuff like that. But the point I'm making with this is that um, if, if the Thin Man series had came out in the TV era, it would be, um, it would be a, probably a TV show. It would probably be a miniseries at the very least. Um, and the first movie became so popular that uh, they decided to make a series of films taking what arguably works best about the, the first one. And I, I'm, I think Daniel may or may not agree with me on this, but is the chemistry between Myrtle Lloyd and William Powell, um, especially because um, it, was, uh, it was kind of a rarity back then. If not, if they, I think, I believe The Thin Man might have been the first movie to show a happy marriage on screen without having to be a comedy of remarriage, uh, which, which might seem, like whatever now, but that really does put a lot of things into perspective. I think when you watch th that first movie with that in mind, uh, compared to other comedies in the screwball genre that came out after that. Um, and then also it was capitalizing on um, the murder mystery, you know, uh, novels uh, that were so prominent 
um, that became really popular in America in the early 1900s and stuff like that. So it was really kind of a nexus point between those two things. And so I think to your point about the sequelization of that first movie, um, I think the fact that uh, I think the fact that it predates TV and that you had these two electric stars who just lit up the screen and, and likely everything that they did. I, I've seen a, only a couple of other Powell and Lloyd collaborations um, outside of, outside of the series, and um, at the very least, they're great in those movies as well. So I can only imagine that's why they wanted to to capitalize on that. Good point. Yeah, man, I love what you said there about how it probably would have been a TV show if it came later. Because the and to answer your question, Chris, the Thin Man series is very unusual uh, for the 1930s. Sequels as a whole are very unusual. Um, generally speaking, if you have like a series of movies in this time period, um, it's going to be a series of movies with like a similar tone, with similar story beats, with the same stars, but they're not actually going to be connected movies. The most obvious example that comes to my mind is um, the Fred and Ginger movies, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Mm -hmm. um, in all of those movies, like they're all very similar and they all have the same star and they're basically playing the same character in pretty much every movie, but they're not technically the same character. They have different names. Mm -hmm. It's almost like um, the Elvis movies might as well be a series, but he <laughs> technically plays a different character in every movie, even though it's, it's really the same character. It's that kind of thing. Um, but it is it does fascinate me that you got so many Thin Man movies where they continued the these roles and they continued their story, at least in terms of family building going forward. Although another uh, one that comes to mind is Torchy Blaine. There's a series in the 30s called Torchy Blaine in which this actress, I can't remember her name, but she's the star of Mystery of the Wax Museum. But she played like this hard nosed Lois Lane inspiring reporter mm -hmm. and she had a series of cool. movies. So you did have that kind of thing occasionally, but um, overall, The Thin Man is kind of an anomaly for sure. Yeah, what I like about like these screwball comedies, um, like, again, I'm not the most educated. I've seen just ones recommended to me and very popular ones. Um, ones in the 30s that make, they just make me really happy because when you think about in America, like it's the Great Depression or recovery from the Great Depression. So you have these uplifting kind of like fun movies that aren't like, you know, about like struggle it's more or less like happy people doing things together which kind of gives the message like whoever your significant other is like stand stand by them stand strong and you will get through like an obstacle and i kind of like that message i don't know if that's intended with the with the filmmakers uh but that's what i really got out of it and i, I really like that speaking of the filmmaker ws van dyke uh interesting name there <laughs> for sure like for Dick sure van dyke yeah is there any relation there or does that just happen to be i don't think so i think i actually looked into it and i don't think so uh, i do like his uh nickname apparently it was one take woody and i really appreciate that the one takes like from my youtube That's channel true. appreciation i'm like yes the one take is like your best friend and i love that <laughs> well, you I guys in like clint why... eastwood Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good, man. <clears throat> I was just going to say to that point, um, like, I think that actually served him on making uh, the first one because I, I, you know, whenever we, whenever we, you know, really get into this installment, the second movie, um, the thing about the first one is that it's often considered by many to be, you know, one of those greatest movie ever made type of movies. Um, and, and I definitely am in that camp. You know, I, I adore the first one. It's one of my all time favorite movies. Um, but it, it definitely is, is the type of movie where it took kind of a journeyman, for what I know, a journeyman director like that to kind of pace things together and to shoot things really fast. Apparently it was a very tight production, very, very rushed at points, if not the whole time. And so W.S. Van Dyke really did kind of help create um, he, not only the, the, the cinematic versions of what we know now as the Nick and Nora Charles repartee, but also um, he had to kind of like take a book and, and focus more on the, the marriage aspects and, and, and make it more, more on them while also delivering the murder mystery uh, accoutrement, if you will. So it was a, it, it's quite an interesting movie from that historical perspective. Um, but yeah, to, and I have to give credit to Van Dyke on that. So who returns to this movie, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you two remember the first time you watched the Thin Man movies? Like Preston, I think you said your mother like fat like introduce that to you or daniel do you know like when you first watched this movie yeah and, and one thing i want to get out of the way right off the bat is i am actually not very knowledgeable about this series 
I've actually only seen the first three movies. Um, and then I, I actually started the fourth movie last night and was not into it and actually ended up bailing on it. Um, I'll, I'll come back to it when I'm maybe more in the mood. I don't know, but it, it, it's, it's different. It doesn't have that sparkle that the previous three do. Interesting. But I saw the first movie because I found the DVD at a pawn shop actually. And it was a movie I like heard of and I was like, okay, I'll buy it. Um, and I watched that DVD many times. It's weird how like I've seen the first Thin Man movie so many times and I've seen, I think, at least three of William Powell and Myrna Lois non-Thin Man collaborations. But yeah, I've only seen the the first three Thin Man movies, technically, because I just <laughs> kept watching that original one over and over. <laughs> and Preston, that. yeah, when did you first see this movie? Oh, yeah. No, this was, um, um, th this series is, is a childhood favorite of mine. I definitely um, have seen the first one the most. Um, especially the first two, I would say, um, uh, even though I do really, really uh, like the third one, but much like uh, uh, Daniel, it's interesting in that um, I kind of, I've always gravitated towards the front half of this series because my mom owns all six of the box set. Um, when I was very young, she bought them all because like she loves, uh, she loves Myrna Loy, but she really, really loves William Powell. I think she kind of has like an old Hollywood thirst for him, to be honest. Can we, can we use thirst on this show? Who among us doesn't? <laughs> yeah, yeah, thirst, thirst following. Yeah. <laughs> Some OH thirsting here, but no. Um, yeah, she's always had a thing for, for that actor. So I saw quite a few of his movies and um, yeah, no, uh, it's just always been, um, the, the original has always just been one of my favorite movies. And it wasn't until Warner Archive started putting out um, the series on Blu-ray discs that I finally started being like, okay, I need to revisit um, these in later installments as an adult and see how they how they how they fare. And so um, I believe uh, after the Thin Man was on HBO Max, um, it definitely was on New Year's because I remember because uh, I literally watched it. Um, it was the it was the it was the first movie I watched. Uh, I believe. Uh, either this year or the last one I watched in 2021. Either way, um, I, I watched it on perfect on the perfect time. And and uh, after the Thin Man, I like a lot as well. I think that movie is so much so much fun. And uh, I can't I can't quite do a rebuttal for the fourth one yet because I still need to revisit that one as a, as an adult. But um, I think it's a fantastic series uh, overall. So that's good. I just because I just watched this the first three in preparation for this podcast. Cause like I own the first one and I, ne I texted Daniel's like, damn it. Why didn't I do participate in like the six for, th for 66 sale for a more archive when they were doing it. Uh, and cause like, I love these first three movies. I mean, my partner, Charlie and I, we watched them and she loved them and I love them. She too, did. So I know she oh. doesn't like old movies. So that's actually really cool. You know, I was going to stop at two, but she was like, let's watch the third one tonight. And she enjoyed it too. And I was like, yeah, I nice. kind of like it too. So yeah, you know, that's always a recipe when you're when your um lady likes the movies you're watching and putting on. But uh I'm I've just I'm just so surprised it took me so long to finally put on a screwball comedy of sorts because like usually I get my recommendations from Daniel and usually he doesn't miss with those um recommendations. Uh but I'm excited for the second one because um my only complaint, my only complaint compared to the first one is it's a little too long. Like I like the runtime of the first one, but other than that for beat for beat, this movie is just as good as the first. And I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, uh, which I think we should um, get out of the bat. I mean, this, I don't know about the first one. I think it was probably nominated for best picture, but this one had one Oscar nomination as well for best screenplay. And I think deservedly. So um, this movie, it's quotes, it's dialogues, the story structure. I mean, I'm very drawn in. I love the performances. Uh, I think this movie heightens more the comedy that the first one was more interested in being a murder mystery. This one has more investment and time to do more comedy bits. And I love that because I think it's one of its strongest suits of the chemistry of the leads. Uh, I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Um, no, like I, I think this movie, uh, I think this movie is just as fantastic as the first one. Um, it's interesting because I, I, everything you said, um, I agree with to a point. Um, I think the movie it does run a little bit long. I think it's actually the longest of the six movies, uh, believe it or not. Because after another Thin Man, the third movie, I think, if I remember correctly, it's ninety minutes or or barely a hundred at that. So um, it goes kind of back to being tight, like the first one is. 
Um, but where I where I do think I differ from you is that um, first off, I think since the show is inside the sequel, I do have to get this out of the way. I think that um, every great sequel, I think even if you do, if, even if you still like the first one better or a successor after or that kind of thing, I think it does something that's better than any any other movie in its franchise. Um, and that's what differentiates a great sequel from a not great one in my eyes. So uh, after The Thin Man, I feel like since they introduced Nick and Nora in the first movie, they really established the rules for what a Thin Man movie is in, in, in regards to, you know, having Nick and Nora, you know, do their thing. They're a married couple. Um, he's an ex-private eye who basically gets roped back into mysteries and his wife is arguably just as clever, if not more clever than him at points. Um, and so you're following their escapades <clears throat> as they're trying to uh, solve mysteries um, while they're drinking the whole time, um, <laughs> which I think is great. Um, and, and, and the first movie ends with, you know, spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen it, um, it ends with basically this amazing dinner table scene uh, where uh, he's trying to get all these suspects to slip and that's how he finds out the killer. But, it, but the first one is very much, as much as I love it, it's very much, you know, screwball comedy. And then uh, there's mystery that happens in the second act. And then it goes to a lot of people being chosen in the third act. And I think it's awesome for that. The second one where I think it improves upon that model is the fact that um, you, do, you do have a lot of extended comedy in the first act with Nick and Nora, especially mm -hmm. as they're going to San Francisco uh, you're meeting her, her relatives for the first time in the franchise um, who hilariously established that they don't like Nick. They think <laughs> that they're, he's just with, with her for his money or, or her money, excuse me, because she, uh, she is part of a rich family. Um, but then um, the movie spends a lot of time in that first act really establishing all these ex-cons and mobsters and blackmailers and backstabbers. And so many red herrings are, are laid bare that really do an, a, an amazing job of confusing the viewer as to who the motives can be of who the killer is. And by the time you get to um, the final act of the movie, it really does play like a classic Dashiell Hammett uh, murder mystery, the, of course, who created these characters uh, through, uh, through, his, through his writing. So um, that is something I do think this movie does do better despite uh, the kind of uh, turgid uh, runtime that we referred to, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And Daniel, you're no stool pigeon. I mean, what were your thoughts after watching After the Thin Man? Um, okay, so I've seen this movie twice now. The first time I saw it was um, right around the time the first Warner Archive Blu-ray came out. I watched it pretty much right away. And I'll be honest, my first reaction to it was, eh, not as good as the first, too long. And I wasn't crazy about it. I thought it was like, fine. And then I watched it again leading up to this podcast and... Um, and I loved it. Like, I thought it was so, so great. I thought it was so much better than I thought the first time. And even though I don't like it as much as the original, um, I don't think it's as good. I don't know why. Like, I'm not sure. I've been trying to figure that out, trying to articulate that. Because um, on one hand, I'm thinking like, well, maybe the mystery is less interesting than in the first movie. Mm -hmm. But I'm not even sure that that's true. Because the truth is, I don't care that much about the mystery in any of these movies. Like it is, it's all about, it's all about the comedy and the, the chemistry for me. That's why like probably my second favorite William Powell, Myrna Loy movie is libeled lady. Like you don't have to deal with the mystery in that movie. It's just a perfect romantic comedy. Um, but that movie aside, uh, this movie is fantastic. I think the dialogue is like astounding, like insanely good. Like I couldn't believe at the rate at which we're getting incredibly clever, funny lines just constantly. Um, mm -hmm. And by the way, while I was watching this, uh, I was started fan cast. <laughs> I started fan casting the MCU with classic film actors, and I'm like, William Powell is Tony Stark all the way, no contest. Oh. <laughs> he nice. has that. He has that Robert Downey Jr. kind of yeah. Ryan Reynolds like vibe to him. Totally, totally. Yeah. <laughs> So we watch classic movies and do fan castings for the MCU. They have it has a chokehold on us, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's fun to think about. It's a fun movie. It is exercise. interesting. I've never thought of that. Also, Libel Lady came out the same year as this movie as well. Um, 
that has both of them together. That's interesting. I should have picked that what movie up during that sale. Dang. Yeah, I, let me I, go I through. Let me go through what came out in 36. A lot of movies I know about, but haven't seen too many, but I figured you guys would know. So Libel Lady came out. Modern Times from Chaplin came that year. My oh, Man yeah. Godfrey that has Powell. Mr. Deeds goes to, t- goes to town with Gary Cooper. Uh, Swing Time, the Aster and Dra- uh, Ginger Rogers collab. And then The Great Zeigfeld, which won Best Picture as well, came out that year. Oh, that's also William Powell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh my yeah. God, that's what a year. Okay, so like 36 has to be a contender for best film year maybe for you two. Uh, <laughs> Didn't you pick like 2013 because Sleepover came out or something? No, but Sleepover would have been in the 20, 2000s, not 2010. 2004, something like yeah, that. Yeah, 2013 would have been a long movie like Sleepover. Um, and yeah, so 36, this movie did really well. I mean, the budget was like 675000 and made like over $3 million is what I saw, which sounds crazy for a movie at that time. Uh, but it seems like all of these um, Thin Man movies made so much money, like, I guess because of the director, he just was like Pre- Preston said, he was just so quick and, and concise with the directing style. It was really inexpensive to make and people love these movies. I think I read after the third movie, people were excited for the fourth because of the, 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 uh, the time between each Thin Man installment was a little bit longer. So they were excited to see the two leads back together. I think that's really cool. I didn't know that these Thin Man movies had such a, um, an impact on society and i totally see like i love lucy vibes you know like these couple power couples together oh, yeah. um and honestly from a from a murder mystery perspective obviously like clue and then like you know we get like knives out but for me it was william powell who gives me such elliot gold like the long goodbye kind of vibes of like this kind of nonchalant oh. kind of detective which i like it kind of gives that you know that kind of prototype type of private eye uh, who's reluctant to be solving mysteries. I kind of like that. Um, and again, the dialogue of this movie is so good. Like there's one quote, like when Nora's like on the phone and like, it's so the first one I think is more of a Christmas movie. And this one's more, it's like a new year's type movie. Um, yeah. and I like how she picks up the phone and William Paul's like, Oh, who was it Nora? And she goes like, Oh, so when you would have known, darling, they're the respectful people, you know, and he's like <laughs> rolling his eyes and he's drinking something. And he, yet, and I was just like, oh my god, that is like so fantastic. Um, That's one of my favorite uh, kind of like running gags, and it's it's all throughout the series where like everybody knows who Nick Charles is because like they either he either put these criminals in jail at some point or he, they're the relatives of, of people that he put in jail. Um, I mean, that's why at the end it's so hilarious when um, Lumkey, oh, whenever, yeah. whenever he, uh, whenever he incapacitates the um, the perpetrator at the very end, and he's just like, wait, like you didn't like, why are you helping him? Like he put your brother away. He was like, I don't like, I don't like my brother. He's in jail. I like his wife. <laughs> <laughs> such a great line. Yeah. It is true. He ha- Nick does have such a good relationship with all these the scum and villainy in this movie. Um, <laughs> I, I like it. Like they leave the the uh, the the train station and he he she he introduces Nora to Finger. It's like you, you, here's Fingers and he's like let him get away with robbing you so he doesn't feel bad that I know. Don't hurt his feelings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. There's also uh, a great scene. Sorry to jump movies, but there's a great mm-hmm. scene in Another Thin Man where a group of criminals throws William Powell like a baby shower party and they all bring their babies. So it's like this oh dad's God. in their babies party. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. That's it's amazing. God, I, need, I need to revisit the, the third one. That movie, yeah, that scene's amazing. If, I haven't seen the last three, but honestly for the first three, it's pretty airtight. I really enjoy it. I could think of it just as a trilogy. Um, although the third one, uh, like what I like about the second one uh, it has the dog Astra. It has more of a prevalent role in this one. The dog. Oh, Astra. He has to deal. He has to deal with the infidelity of like leaving his dog uh, wife, and then when he comes back, he's got just one dog that looks a little different. And I'm like, what a weird subplot in the movie. <laughs> Speaking of infidelity, another running joke I love through this series is it's very common for people to assume that Myrna Loy is his mistress and not his wife. And he always lets them believe that every time. 
<laughs> oh yeah, there's that scene in the in uh I think it's Polly uh Polly's club or the club that Phil's club, excuse me, mm-hmm. uh where uh they look at Myrna Loy and they're just like, Oh yeah, like this is your mistress, right? You you bring a different woman in each time and then she just smiles because that's just <laughs> that's just their their thing, you know. No, it's it's so it's so good. Yeah, so this movie, it, it so they go like Daniel had said earlier. This movie, they go to Nora's family, and you get introduced a bunch of boring older characters, which I think that's part of the joke because there's that funny scene where Nick's with all the men and they're all snoring, and he's having a conversation <laughs> with himself with them. I <laughs> love that scene so much. That scene reminded me a lot of this past weekend because Chris and I and my wife Stephanie and his girlfriend Charlie, we all went to a movie theater to see Dario Argento's Tenebrae, which was really cool. Oh wow! And towards the beginning of the movie i look around and everyone is asleep chris stephanie and charlie they're all asleep and i'm sitting there by myself (laughs) it was a late screening (laughs) yeah that's yeah i guess watching an argento movie that late in the day like that would but i feel like if you if you literally go to the movies to see that like you know you should know what to expect but (laughs) no press did we pulled our own William Powell. We were drinking so much. Like we couldn't hang. <laughs> I could. I watched the movie just fine. Vibes were, vi- couldn't hang. The internet knows I can't hang. Well, speaking <laughs> Well, speaking of like, uh, there's a great line in this movie where William Powell tells Myrna Loy, um, hey, let's go get something to eat. Uh, I'm thirsty. <laughs> 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 yeah. Drinking jokes galore. Uh, and, and that's the thing too. Like uh, I tweeted about this movie yesterday when I was watching it. Uh, yesterday uh, yesterday evening uh, I found that I, it feels like even though the Hays Code was 1934 which is when the first movie was made I feel like this movie since it's so early on in the series it's, since it's still pretty early on in movie history to be honest um, like I mean um, um, movies had synchronized sound like barely 10 years before for the first time um it feels like this movie's really fighting through that code and you're really getting a lot of those like innuendos and uh jokes about alcohol that you wouldn't get in in likely a, a much later thin man movie that's good i like how in this movie the comedy with a couple isn't so ball and chain like happy wife happy life it's more or less yes, like i hate that comedy right i love how they're like <laughs> I love how they're like, we're making jokes to each other, but then William Paul's like, oh, I love you, darling. And then she's like, yeah, well, you know, you saw me on the other side of this mountain and you still love me then. You know, it's kind of like sweet, but like conflicting at times. I don't know how to describe it. It's a very healthy relationship and I'm very jealous of it. It's what most <laughs> couples describe for. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely detest ball and chain humor. Um, like another comedy from the 30s, and it's actually a very popular comedy that a lot of people really love that I saw for the first time recently was It's a Gift, the W.C. Fields movie. And that movie is constant nagging wife. My wife sucks. Oh, why won't my wife give me peace? My wife, blah, blah, blah. And I couldn't stand it. Like it drove me insane. Oh, wow. Um, but, but then the Thin Man movies, they're wonderful. They're a team. They're partners. They have total trust in each other. No one ever suspects for a second anybody's being unfaithful. There's even a scene in this movie where, where Nick Charles accidentally kills another, kills, I'm so sorry, kisses another girl at a New Year's party and then because he's so drunk and he realized like, oh, I'm sorry. And he goes back up to Nora and she washes the lipstick off his face and says something like, oh, you've got blood on you. He just washes it <laughs> off and that's it. <laughs> Uh, I just, no, I, I just yeah go ahead Preston oh I'm sorry no I, I was just gonna say I completely agree with Daniel um I I I I miss I wish movies more movies from this time um I feel like Game Night really is is the the first movie in a, in a while to really recapture that kind of Nick and Nora Charles effect where again it's just a a couple that they're 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 solving a, they're 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 solving the these these crimes these issues but it, it's the, the happiness of this couple that's healthy um, where they don't have really any conflict with one another that really propels that movie. Um, it helps propel that movie into, into excellence in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. and, um, and, and I wish even more sequels had that. I think, Daniel, I think it was you, you talked a little bit about, uh, um, I think when you were on Matt's show the last time you talked about The Legend of Zorro, how um, I wish that movie would have had more of like a Mummy Returns thing um, where uh, that that whole second mummy movie is just uh, Rick and and uh, 
Rachel Weisz's character just being Nick and Nora, basically. And like, that's why I, I still enjoy that movie on some level. Maybe that's one of my guilty, you know, favorite sequels. Oh, I, I enjoy that movie too. <laughs> writing sure. it down, writing it down. Good. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a big My Returns fan. Rock, bad CGI and all. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> truthfully, but but no, I, I feel like The Legend of Zorro could have taken a playbook out of, out of that movie. And, and I wish more movies that are sequels with, you know, a, a male and a female lead or even even a couple uh, just of any kind would would uh, would utilize that type of, of repartee. I think it makes for just a, a delight and you don't, you just don't get that out of movies now. So I agree. TV shows are really bad about that too where they get so much drama out of will they won't they yeah. drama and then they get the couple together and then they find a reason to break them up because they realize they don't know how to write a man and woman as a team, which is weird. Um, like, I mean, look at like friends, like they spend forever getting Ross and Rachel together and then they're almost immediately broken up because I don't know how to create drama otherwise if we don't have this. <laughs> it's so True. lazy. And the mm-hmm. Thin Man movies very well avoid that, which is great. Right. And I think what's smart in this movie is it kind of shows the two different sides, like what a happy, healthy couple looks like. And in the opposite end, the drama comes from Robert, um, who's married to who's the cousin, I believe, of Nora, um, who are other co-stars. Um, her Robert's is... the cousin-in-law of, of Nora, because Nora, because Robert's married to it's. I know it's very it's very labyrinthine. Uh, mm-hmm. She's uh, Selma Ro- is her cousin, Selma. right? Yeah. So she's married to Robert, who it's only like marriage, not because they love each other, but because of wealth, I believe, right? Because of like. I think that's all it was or an arranged marriage of sorts, but Jimmy Stewart's character um, who was in love with Selma had to be backed off obviously. And he's like her friend now and kind of like the friend is like, you know, if you two don't work out, like I'll totally be your best friend and I'll be the shoulder you lean on kind of guy, you know? And uh, Robert's just like this gross guy who just does not like Selma at all. And, and kind of just kind of is like, I'm here you know, kiss me goodbye. I'm off again. You won't do anything about it. And he's like having affairs. And, and then he goes to the club where Nick and Nora have their new year's party, which besides yep. seeing Robert there, cause I, he's so skeevy and, ugh, you know, and he's so like suave about it. Um, I love the new year's like setup. I love like the, the dance number, uh, by the performer. I love the drama with, um, dancer as well. I think he's kind of slimy as well, but I love the way he, I love these suave, like toxic dudes like i think it's just really entertaining to see on t- on screen um it's just like a lot of production values are in it and i was like yeah this movie's got it going and it's got some drama that's not from the leads and the leads are having their beat comedy with it it's it's really good i like that stuff any thoughts you two on robert and uh dancer <laughs> oh yeah no i i think everything from so everything from you from them uh you know getting off the train and, and that kind of thing to going from the nightclub, like that whole club bit, it reminded me of like straight up, like a Baz Luhrmann fever dream, except 1936 uh, on new year's. Like it, it, it's, you get, you get indulged into that decadence, the, the skeezy, the skeeviness of, um, of, uh, of, of, you know, Robert, like you were saying, uh, dancer, I think is, <laughs> is a, a hilariously uh, just silly kind of like crony all throughout the movie. Like he, uh, the decisions he makes and the way that he kind of constantly uh, coalesces with each of the characters, um, uh, especially Nick Charles, um, who again is that clever genius who really drives a lot of the mis- uh who drives the, uh, obviously the heroism along with his wife of these movies. Um, uh, I think I think he makes, um, he, he, he's a great character for that for sure. Yeah, it's interesting to have a murder mystery where the murder victim's kind of a piece of shit that nobody likes. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> Just out of I curiosity. Love... Go ahead. Oh, um, have you guys ever seen Evil Under the Sun by chance? Or um, it's one of the old... so. It's one of the old Hercule Poirot movies. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and I, I talked about it a little bit on Lindsay's uh, podcast, our friend Lindsay Wilkins, because uh, half of the, the, the new episode that we recorded is about whodunits. So um, basically, Evil Under the Sun is, is a movie where uh, Perot, I think he's played by Peter Ustinov, and the cast is massive. It's like Maggie Smith, Diana Rigg is like this really unlikable, horrible, honestly, like wretched individual. 
uh, who ends up getting bumped off in the middle of the movie. And, and the whole last half of the movie is you having to sort of through like James Mason, Roddy McDowell, all these different popular actors just to figure out who killed Diana Rigg essentially. And I think that's just a, a thing of, of, of the genre is that you don't want to, you either want to like the, 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 uh, the suspect a lot, like Knives Out, like you really come to love Christopher Plummer, um, or you really want them to be the most unlikable, like I could care less about this person kind of thing. So yeah, they just need to be memorable one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. I need yeah. to get into those old Hercule Poirot movies because I don't really like the Brana ones, but I bet there's a lot of good older ones to check out. There, um, uh, Death on the Nile, um, uh, the uh, the original is pretty good. Uh, Merle Orient Express is 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 awesome. Um, okay. The one the one that Sidney Lumet did. Um, my favorite is actually Evil Under the Sun. Like it's just breezy. It's just a Saturday afternoon kind of comfort watch and. Uh, it's just relaxed. And I love Peter Usnaz Perot as opposed to Branagh because I can feel Branagh's ego in, in, in his murder versus like um, in, um, in, the, in Peter Usnaz's portrayal, I feel like he's so goofy and just playful um, and he's so self-effacing. He reminds me a lot of William Powell in these movies as a matter of fact. So mm, I, I okay. recommend that one. Does his version have a mustache origin story? <laughs> you know, Lindsay told me about that. I still haven't. I still. Oh, okay. I, I'm, going, I'm going to watch Death on the Nile eventually. So yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I, but I, I, I don't know. He does not have a mustache origin story. Chris, have you seen think. Death on the Nile? The newer one? Yeah. No, I haven't. I didn't like the trailer, so I didn't see it. You're fine. So Kenneth Branagh's Kirkio Perot, you know, he has a giant mustache. And yeah. they have this flashback scene at the beginning of the movie where he's young and he's in the war and he like, you know, takes a wound on that in the battlefield and has this big scar here on his upper lip. And his fiance is like, well, you'll grow a mustache. And then oh it comes to credits. <laughs> and it's like, now we know why he has the giant mustache. Oh, <laughs> geez. <laughs> oh, man. It's just, oh, man. I, I don't know. I just... <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing i want to bring up i find is interesting because i noticed after watching the third movie and talking about it with charlie is the first movie william powell nick works with the police pretty well you know with the lieutenant in the movie in the second one you get lieutenant abrams who is like his voice is so annoying but he's such a fascinating odd character especially when he's doing like the um interrogating and like Nick is like hands offish in like in the scene where they're in dancer's office and all the police are there and Nick's just in underneath the the desk and ever there's a shooting and it's oh, dark he's that. drinking. Oh yeah. Yeah, great stuff. And he's very much like these cops are kind of not all there. I guess I'll help them out reluctantly. And then in the third movie, these police are just like accusing him and Nora and they're just like not at odds with each other until like <laughs> point obvious that nick and nora are like innocent and it's like i like how the police become like oh we cooperate with them and they're kind of idiots and now they're, they're accusing us so like you know screw them until they kind of come you know to terms with their being idiots um which is i think was kind of interesting i think because lieutenant abrams is such a central character to this movie like he's constantly with nick and nora helping them with the investigation um which you know I think is good. He kind of fills in that role. Well, um, I just think he's just a goofy looking character in this world, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I kind of wish we got more like scenes with uh, Jimmy Stewart in this movie since um, you know, it's Jimmy Stewart. I don't know how big he was up until this point. So, um, and in the first movie, it's Cesar Romero is kind of like the kind of like the Jimmy Stewart pre character in the first movie. And I was like, Oh, that'd be cool. If like these young and up and coming actors are being like these side characters of sorts, you know, mm -hmm. you know, back to the talking about the police officers. Yeah. I, I really like the, the, the cop in the first movie. Cause he's kind of an idiot and he mm -hmm. makes an appearance back in another thin man. Yeah. There's a very yeah. interesting thing about you'll notice if you watch a lot of old movies, cops are almost or pretty much never cool in old movies, like they're always stupid for comedy relief or they're dicks. It's, you don't really start getting cool cops until I've heard that the first movie to really have a cool cop is a bullet with Steve McQueen, which is like the late sixties. And I can't really refute that whether that's true or not. 
Um, but yeah, the Thin Man movies very much follow that where you you have the cool detective is a private eye and that's how pretty much all noir films are. And then he's got to kind of work around this police officer that's always kind of pretending to be in charge and thinks he's in charge, but definitely isn't. And William Powell's very much leading him around the whole way. It's very, very fun. Yeah. I think <clears throat> I think part of that too, to your point, Daniel, is a uh, a lot of uh, a lot of kind of the plots of older movies, especially from this era, are about what we what what we would think are taboo subjects. Like again, cheating, scandals, remarriage, divorce, those kinds of things. And so, making cops cool, even in context of of movies that aren't genre films, as it were, but comedies, which is kind of like be. I, I think. Perhaps audiences thought that cops were just lame and they wanted to see like lame cops, like, but maybe that's what you're thinking on my part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, though, when it comes like this movie's a lot longer, there's a lot more details to the mystery. There's way more layers to it as well. Like the whole, I mean, Asta or uh, Astra getting like, you know, the, the them chasing Astra to get like a clue to the puzzle, to the mystery and like being, you know, as like a, as an elaborate decoy in the hindsight of the scheme of the killer. And like, I love the detective work that Nick does in this movie. Like when he goes to this Anderson character's hotel uh, and like gets on his hands and knees and kind of paints to the audience without saying anything, how this, um, this assailant was like operating. You don't get that in the first movie, but you get it in the second movie. And I love yes. that. Um, and it was to the point where this mystery where I was like, I really don't know who the killer is. And I kind of have an idea who it was. And I was completely wrong uh, because it did such a good job in the, in the screenwriting about like fleshing out a lot of even these minor characters to the point where they are suspicious. Or it also gave me the, the, the preconceived notion that this is a sequel. They're not going to do the beat by beat of the first movie where it's the spoilers, like the butler or lawyer um, that's next to Nick. Um, and when it reveals, I'm like, wow, I totally didn't see that. I had a suspect, but I kind of hoped it wouldn't because of the, you know, the person, but I got to give it props. Oh yeah. No, agreed. I, I think part of that is the beauty of dancer to kind of go back to that, that include mm-hmm. that you mentioned, like, I, cause dancers, that character who like his allegiances, like either like switch, I found on this viewing quite a bit, or he's very quick to like pit people against each other to just basically <laughs> divert all suspicions off of him. Um, especially at the end where um, Nick is like so close to finding out who the killer is. Like he's, it's the classic, again, much like the first one uh, where um, he's putting all the suspects in the room and basically to basically get them to slip as he's recanting his, his, you know, his mental investigation. And it's Dancer who's the first one to go, oh yeah, um, well, Selma, (laughs) Selma, you know, and, and this other person, like they, they were clearly in on it. Like she's, she's mentally fucked up. It's definitely, it's definitely her. She called Robert. So it's, it's, and, and a lot of the characters are like that in very different ways, which I find interesting. Mm-hmm. Daniel, would you say you kind of have an idea who was going to be the, like the perpetrator at the end of the movie? I don't remember because I saw the movie for the first time, like a, probably a year ago or so. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will say the killer reveal is a reveal is a lot better in this movie because I think the killer reveal is almost inconsequential in the first movie. I (laughs) don't care. I mean, that's a five out of five movie for me. I love it so much, but I mean, the lawyer is the killer. Like who cares? In fact, I did a, I did an episode on the original, the thin man on cobwebs with Keith rich. And we both agreed, like, we're not going to spoil the ending partially just, you know, in case people haven't seen it, but also who cares? There's like nothing to say about it. (laughs) There is in this movie. um, Mm -hmm. It's a much better killer reveal. And part of that has to do with the fact that you've got Jimmy Stewart. And I will say, perhaps controversial statement, I I think he's overplaying crazy and angry in the final scene. I think it's an interesting, (laughs) I think it's an interesting case study to see Jimmy Stewart play dark before he went to war. And he's not as good at it. It's a lot more actory and performancey. And then when he comes back from the war and he does It's a Wonderful Life and movies with Anthony Mann and Hitchcock, it's re- it feels a lot more authentic and real. So because he has darkness to draw me. from. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he has darkness to draw from. And also, because uh, I, I was, I actually share your, your views on, on his performance, Daniel. I think, I think he's good in the movie for the most part. But I think when that killer reveal comes, I think once he starts like chewing his hand, I was like, okay, dude, you're going big. And I get it. Like you're a young actor. 
you know, you're, you you want to be hungry. You want to really show people in this like sequel to this really successful movie. Okay, who just who the fuck James Stewart is? You know, like I'm not Jimmy Stewart. I'm James Stewart. You know, Ooh. like that that type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it feels very much like Michael Keaton in Batman when he was like, "You want to get nuts? Let's get nuts." You know, that's good what call. I get. Yeah, <laughs> good point. Good point. Um, and, and I mean, I actually me and a buddy of mine. Um, um, uh, not too long ago, like we we watched a scene with that movie for the first time that had a really early True Williams performance, mm-hmm. and uh, that was a critique that that we had of of this movie was that Treat was going like really big with the with the swings and stuff like that um, in terms of his acting, and it, it it was like the more the movie went on, he became more comfortable, and we ended up really really liking the movie overall. But it was just it's just one of those things. I think you get that out of out of actors, even legends like a James Stewart. Um, before they they really have that life experience to channel into better arguably better roles yeah and, and chris to answer your earlier question about where was jimmy stewart at this point in his career here um i pulled up i, I pulled up his filmography in order and before this movie he just done a few like very small rom com looking movies nothing i've ever heard of he did do a movie called speed from 1936 so Lindsay Wilkins, I'm charging you to do an episode on Speed 1936 and Speed 1994. Um, <laughs> no, but nothing I've ever heard of before this, just a few movies. Oh, that's interesting. Because like when I saw, I didn't know, like I didn't do like any research. And I was like, oh, there's Jimmy Stewart. It's James Stewart in this movie. I was like, oh, man, I wonder what he's going to play and stuff like that. And I was like, I'm going to like his character. And I did up to the point. And then it's like, I love his character and how much he's invested in Selva and like protecting her. But then it's also like, there's some like red flags with this character at the same time. And it's like dancer, Robert, um, you know, James Stewart's character. I'm like, who's the good guy here? <laughs> like, cause they all kind of have like these questionable, um, you know, traits, which again, I think the movie just does really well and throughout like a lot of red herrings, like Presley said earlier, this movie really sets up. And then when Nick pulls in Nora's family as well, and I was like, oh, I knew yeah. it. It's going to be the old couple of the family. It's going to be crazy. And it's like, oh, no, I was totally wrong. I wish it was dumb, but it's totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely, definitely. Um, no, is it just me or does like Jimmy Stewart's character in this movie, like he gives me like kind of insult energy especially because my rewatch was hey, like Selma. so soon after <laughs> Can you please like leave, Robert? Oh, come on, Selma, please. <laughs> Tell us, like, is I- it weird to p- try to pay off your crush's husband to leave? <laughs> it seems weird to me. <laughs> No, it's 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 very weird to me. That's why I asked because I was just like that had me scratch my. It wasn't a big problem. I don't care that much, but it was one of those things. I was like, yeah, I don't know if you could you could remake this fit, thin man in in twenty twenty two. Like that's that's a little weird, dude. <laughs> he's the killer, you know. So he's the bad guy. True, true, true. Yeah, it, I don't know how you would recreate this movie in the modern century, but I would like to see someone try. That'd be pretty interesting. Um, Todd Phillips. <laughs> yeah yeah the main character pays off pays off uh i, I don't even want to go into i don't i don't know my thoughts were um <laughs> i do really like this movie though i think it's like the first one and the second one for sure i think are top tier ones for me i'll rewatch them often um an, uh another thing man i do enjoy a lot too um i think the reveal is a little less and less like climatic as like in like big is like the first two i feel like it's a more interesting like pivot but it doesn't feel as big and um i guess suspenseful and like funny at the same time like the first two kind of do i, I really think, like I think, it go ahead man oh go ahead no uh well sorry I, I was just the only thing i was gonna say was i really like another thin man a lot like i, I think it's a i think it's an, another great entry uh but i think it definitely feels like more comfortability between W.S. Van Dyke, uh, between Loy and Powell, like, again, after the success of Libel Lady, which, again, came out the same year as this. Like, it feels like, okay, we're going to build a movie around them. They have a kid now in this one um, and with the dog as well. Um, and, uh, and and the movie is going to be more about that. So I guess, in a way, it kind of goes back to... Um, kind of the, the breezy, carefree nature of the first movie for me, uh, just without the punch that makes that movie a five-star movie uh, it, it to me, sure. but yeah. It's like, everyone better be careful of my dreams because in my dreams, if you die, you die in real life too. 
is like another thin man <laughs> and i'm like oh, yeah. okay <laughs> i love the Cuba- i love the, the the cuban bar like this these movies have really great atmosphere for outside of a house I know. It's, it's like i wish we still had those kind of things in a way you know i want to go to those nightclubs like nightclubs today they're not fun like they're only <laughs> there they only exist to like if you're going in trying to get laid with a stranger like that's kind of the only thing the, the, the only way they function but i'm like with these nightclubs like it's a cool place to hang out you can have a seat have a drink eat something or you can get up and dance or you can just do whatever it just looks like a good time mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. agreed preston agreed. tell us all about your nightlife right now <laughs> oh my nightlife it is nowhere near uh nick and Nora charles that's for sure um no i i think <laughs> i think the last like I mean, aside from John Wick, I think the last like really memorable nightclub scene in a movie is Collateral, but I, I don't want to mm, I don't want to be really shot at by Tom Cruise though. <laughs> that would be scary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, about another uh, Thin Man. I, I feel like I like another Thin Man just as much as this movie. In fact, while I was watching it, I thought, well, this might be the most interesting mystery out of the three, but now I can barely remember it. Like, I don't know how you guys feel, but like. I feel like the mysteries in these movies are so forgettable. It's just all about the dialogue and just hanging out with the characters. Like that's all I really care about. Good point. Yeah. No, they are. It's 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 kind of like uh, I call it the Rio Bravo effect. Like Rio Bravo, I think is 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 one of the great movies. Um, but like I don't care about the story that much. I, I'm there to hang out with Wayne, with with Martin, with with. Uh, with Nelson, with Dickinson, like those people. Again, Chris brought long goodbye earlier. And and that's kind of Big Lebowski 0.5, basically, where <laughs> like where you know the mystery matters, you know, it, it gives the story stakes, but you're there to watch Elliot Gould react to all these crazy characters. It's it's the enjoyment is is less about the mystery and more about uh the protagonist. And, and I feel that's definitely true with these movies. I don't mm-hmm. think the mystery matters in the Big Lebowski, though. Like literally, no, it doesn't matter. <laughs> but what a great movie, though. Yeah, oh, sure. yeah, yeah. I, I just got to say, though, just to kind of wrap it up. I really like enjoy these movies, and uh, I really recommend them to people. Even if you think, oh, it's too black and white, or you know, it's, it's you know, it's just too old for me. Like, check them out. I think regardless they're very entertaining movies at least for the first three i would say i guess it'll be yet to say until i watch the remaining three i do impl- intend to watch all three of them although i started getting a little fatigued near the end of the third one and i'm curious how the light latter three will be because i watched them back to back to back you know right right yeah yeah the, this movie's so much fun and i love the final scene so much where where she's knitting a little tiny sock and revealing that she's pregnant Mm -hmm. and he gives his signature like mouth open face that he makes at the end of the first movie too and i one of the greatest final lines like in all of movies to me is she says that you call yourself a detective so good like (laughs) perfect final line perfect cut to black for sure for sure but also it's concerning because she's been drinking the whole movie what so, is going on? So I, I have something about that. Back okay. then, um, um, it wasn't. I don't think it was until the fifties or the sixties that they found out that alcohol, that drinking while pregnant um, is is detrimental to the child. Oh, interesting. Yeah, Man, so oh. many people walking around with brain damage back then. <laughs> it's a rough time. <laughs> I'm sorry, that about, was too dark. I was, was about to dark. cancel her too on the internet. Damn it, <laughs> Nora Charles, what are you doing? be responsible (laughs) uh yeah but no i I really enjoy these movies guys like so um is there anything else you want to say i I am curious like what other um william powell or myra loy films do you recommend so it sounds like reliable ladies a movie i really need to check out i think the next movie i was really hoping to look at was um uh my man godfrey as well um any other recommendations my man Godfrey is just William Powell. It's him and Carol Lombard. So no Myrna Loy in that one, right? She's not even a supporting actor, right? No, no. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's Carol Lombard, uh, who's also like kind of a, a patron saint of the of the screwball comedy genre. So definitely, For sure. definitely looking at her as well. Uh, I would actually recommend Mr. Roberts. I think Mr. Roberts is not as good as um, uh, uh, um, 
his thirties work or even his forties work. But I, I, but I think that that's a, that's a pretty sweet, uh, sweet comedy. Uh, I remember liking it a lot when I was younger. I haven't, okay. I haven't rewatched it in a long time, so I'm going to have to, uh, so, so I, re I recommend it with caution, but I, I think, it, I think, I think it's a really, really fun movie, but yeah, no, William Powell, um, uh, God, there was one, there was a crazy one with him and Myrna Loy. Is it love crazy? Is that the one where it's just like, uh, it's just, it just feels like that movie's so absurd. Love um, crazy is one of the most bonkers things I've ever witnessed. Like, <laughs> and not really in a good way. Okay, Chris, this is what this movie is. So William Powell and Myrna Loy are married. And there is a misunderstanding that he has been unfaithful when he hasn't really, but she thinks he has. So she wants to divorce him. And there's like no conversation between the two of them. It's just like, we're getting divorced. I'm out leaves. And he doesn't want to get divorced. And he finds out that you, you can't legally divorce an insane person, a person who's been <laughs> declared legally insane. So he fakes being legally insane and gets institutionalized in an asylum just so she won't divorce him. And it's like wildly offensive depictions of mental health, basically. Yeah, no, it's 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 a weird one um, for sure. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one who's seen that movie. <laughs> uh, I just want to love like they have, you know. Oh, so romantic. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, so there's some good recommendations there for so for those who are listening. I you got my seal of approval to like check out the at least I think the, at least the first three of these movies. Um but yeah, okay, guys. Well, I really appreciate you being on here to spread some love on um, some silver screen films. Um, and what's next for you guys? Uh, let's start with Daniel. What do you got going on? What Where can people check out your podcast? Um, so, well, it's the Cobwebs podcast. It's in all podcast apps. Um, we, we did a couple of Westerns episodes recently. Preston and I talked about those Jimmy Stewart Westerns. Our next episode is with Matt Bledsoe talking about Gregory Peck in The Gunfighter. And then all through June, we are doing a 50s drive-in series where we are talking about sci-fi horror movies of the 1950s. And it's all like drive-in themed. And I've got like clips from old drive-in ads like put in there. And Chris is on the first episode. Chris and Mitch and I talked about them, the killer ant movie. Um, so yeah, that, we're going to be doing that all through the month of June. Hell yeah, yeah. I hope people enjoy that one. I wasn't too drunk for it. So I don't know how funny I am on it. So <laughs> pretty funny, pretty funny. Not going to lie. There you go. Preston, what, what next, uh, what next, next guest spots are you going to be on it's coming up or where can people check you out and check out these uh, William Powell film rankings that you have on Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> Rank the Powellverse. You better change your name to William Powell Stan account as like your Twitter handle <laughs> or something of that William sort. William Powell Pundit, Merloy, Merloy Standom, um, 2022. No, um, no, um, uh, uh, again, thank you for having me first off. Like this was, this was so much fun. Um, you can find me on, uh, on Twitter at, uh, P R E, uh, S sorry. P R E S T O M I T. Uh, and then on letterbox at P R E S T O underscore M I T C H. Um, I'm going to be, um, there's a, a schlock and I, I was recently, uh, we recently recorded, uh, where I talk about, uh, design for living, the Ernst Lubitsch movie, um, as well as death trap, the, um, Sidney Lumet movie. Um, so that's, that was a really fun double feature to do. And then, um, and then coming soon, I will, um, our buddy Matt Bledsoe is going to be doing a series on 90s superheroes as well. So I'm going to be on one of those episodes talking about the Rocketeer. So uh, those are a few things I've got kind of bubbling up at the moment. Oh, I'm excited for both of those things. Um, I want to thank you two both for being back on here again. Um, if this is everyone, anybody's first time listening to Inside the Sequel, you're coming at a great time. We're going to be starting off, kicking things back off as a normal schedule uh, like we did last year. And uh, if you want to check out the podcast, you can listen to us on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you listen to your um, spot, uh, your podcast. We're on there. You can check me out on Twitter at Hurtastic underscore Chris as well. Pretty inactive there, except just, you know, saying random stupid shit. So if you like that kind of thing, you can follow us there. Follow the podcast at uh, Sequel Pod. Um, email the show at sequelpod at gmail.com as well. I really do enjoy like those uh, emails that I get they're, they're I don't ever respond to them, but I really enjoy reading the hell out of them. Why so, not? <laughs> I'm too shy. You know, when it's an email, it's like, I, I don't know how to respond to it. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you're, if you like this episode, then I, 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 I really encourage you to stick around for our next week's episode where we have 
um, Hayden and Mark Warner uh, for Pirates of the Caribbean 3 at World's End. Um, that'll be out. So be excited for that one. Preston and- is dying laughing when you revealed that episode. <laughs> I love it. I love the yeah. ideas. So much. Yeah, I, 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 and I mean, you could see all the episodes I haven't posted yet on recording, but then the last episode for the month, which we'll have, we'll have Doug McCambridge and Lindsay Wilkins um, on, which we'll be talking about Sonic 2 as well to wrap up the month. So look out for that one. Um, other than that, thank you all for tuning into Inside the Sequel. Remember, if you are watching 1930 screwball comedies, do you really care about cinema? Other than that, we'll see you next time. <laughs>